Hello and welcome back to Chicken Chat Tuesday. We're so excited that you're here with us. My name is Brittany Sweeney. I'm the Communications Manager with the Livestock Conservancy. Joining with me today are Jeanette Berenger, our Senior Programs Manager, and Pat Foreman. Yeah, we're so excited to have Pat here. So just real quick, if you've got questions, please put them in the comments and we will get to them after our chat today. We will be talking about how backyard poultry can be climate change activists. I'm excited to learn about this. I hope everyone else is too. Um, also, real quick comment. Um, we just wanted to say special thanks to our uh, sponsors, Tractor Supply Company and Stanley Western Forge for helping make these chicken chats possible and other programming. So without further ado, Jeanette, do you want to introduce Pat? Of course. Uh, be nice. <laughs> might be afraid. <laughs> I, uh, um, I, I'm so pleased to have Pat uh, with us because she and I go way, way back. We're old uh, Mother Earth news buddies. And gosh, we've been presenting at Mother Earth uh, fairs for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, and Pat's become a real good chicken buddy. She's as crazy about chickens as I am. And um, the, the wonderful thing about Pat is she, she thinks outside the box and does so much more with chickens. And I'm thinking about, you know, eating and showing, and she is thinking about therapeutic chickens and chickens, uh, to help the environment. And, um, I always have an education when I, uh, spend time with her and of course, a lot of giggles, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> lots of stories, uh, but today we're we're talking about uh, a topic that's uh, become really uh, central to to what you do recently, which is how to use chickens for um, improving the environment and and um, you know helping with climate change. And so I think there's uh, people that would be really interested in that, and also interested in knowing that even a humble backyard flock can can be useful and um, so Pat, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself and, and how this all plays into and being environmental activists with chickens? Well, I'd rather talk about chickens than talk about myself, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but but what's, what's amazing is, is they do have so many skill sets that can be employed uh, with future generations in mind. And, and one of them is and simply our trash collection about uh, Thirty percent of all household trash could be composted in some form or another, and and of that, the average person literally trashes just about two hundred and twelve pounds. These are statistics from the from the uh, um, basically EPA. I didn't make all this up, although I could if I wanted to. But but it, it's really really valid. But the average person, you and I, all of us, um, trashes about two hundred and twelve pounds a a year. That's a food and yard waste. And a lot of that could have been composted and or chicken feed. Uh, and it's a, the cycle that goes, goes together with it. So the thing about chickens that's so valuable is their manure. Um, besides, of course, their chicken dinners that they provide us and, and all the entertainment and all the other furry little, I guess, fuzzy, feathery little factors. Um, yeah, I'll have they, to say every time I'm cleaning the chicken coops, my husband's like, where are you putting that? You know, because right. he's got a big garden and he wants to make sure I'm, you know, I, I call him when I'm cleaning the chicken. So I'm like, okay, well, you take it where you want to, but it, it, he treats it like gold. That's right. It's mine, mine. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. I mean, it's, like, it's, uh, it, it's incredible. In fact, uh, Brittany, if you could put up that one uh, with the, uh, one of those uh, handouts. Absolutely. That's a good one. So, so this is actually the table of contents for city chicks, the second ed and and chicken tractor. In a way, all all my books have a very similar uh, slant. It's just the the size and and the uh, level of of employing them. But you see on there, you just start with a few birds and, and you take your grass clippings. Uh, you can even use the grass clippings in the in the coop or or put it directly in the garden for mulch. The chickens manure their bedding nicely, and all that bedding then can go into compost, or you can use it as a mulch on, on uh, you know, uh, soil, or if you're doing cover crops, you can plant those directly in them. And then that, that chickens then can work in the garden. They can, they're insecticiders, herbiciders, uh, pesticiders, and they're, they're fuel-free. 
I mean, literally just about all insecticides, herbicides, and, and uh, fertilizer is, guess what? Oil-based. I mean, think about that. So if mm -hmm. our oil stops, our supply of fertilizer and, 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 and uh, herbicides, insecticides, literally just about stops, uh, including our whole food supply because it takes so, so much oil uh, just to, for planting, for harvesting, for refrigeration, processing. Uh, it's, it's pretty much clear that if our food supply stops, we stop and there won't be a slowdown. It'll just be a, be a stop. Um, if there, there were no oil. But getting back to the garden, <laughs> so the chickens lay eggs for people to eat, of course, and they also can hatch little babies. The table scraps become part of their food, which then goes back to, to um, you know, feed the chickens and their manure, uh, which is the prize, believe it or not, uh, then goes to grow local foods. So that's, that's the diagram. That's like a permaculture classic diagram. And Brittany, if you'd put up that other handout, Absolutely. And we'll put up links to all of these after so people can see them so they're not so tiny oh, on yeah, the screen great. right now. <laughs> okay, so here's here's the conventional trash collection system. And, and again, you know, the average person, 212 pounds, take that times 330 million in the U.S., uh, you've got a lot, mountains and mountains of, of, of landfills. In fact, they're filling up so fast. So the traditional model is all the grass clippings and leaves, everything trash just goes to the dump, to the dump, to the dump, to the dump, 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 whatever it is. But with family flocks and composting, the grass, leaves, even cardboard, um, you add the chicken manure to it. You don't need the trash collection to be hauled. You're not filling in the landfills, which creates methane from, a, from the organic matter that's in there as methane generation, which is global warming gas. And then that manure can literally go, or the compost and all that trash can literally be composted, uh, broken down by, by microbes and creating compost and topsoil, which sequesters carbon. So it's like a quadruple hitter about uh, using backyard and yard flocks and employing chickens, even on a grander scale, to, to not just keep methane from forming, but also uh, compost, um, uh, sequester carbon. And it could be done on really large levels. Uh, if we start with backyards, that's great. But there is the Vermont Compost Company that takes around 42 tons, I think it was a year, and they uh, do it with the working composters. So that's the model. That's what my TED talk was about. And um, I think that's it's something that is going to be coming of age really fast because egg cells uh, for hatching eggs are, are up. Uh, the chick sales are literally across the country almost sold out. And more and more people are literally getting into backyard flocks and realizing that we've got to have to be more a little food nutritious as well as independent if we're going to navigate a very healthy future for the next generations. So that's mm -hmm. my stump speech. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> that's a record time. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, uh, it, there are a lot of other really neat things that, that you've done with chickens over the years. And I, I always love to hear about um, you setting up uh, hatching, uh, you know, incubators in uh, senior living facilities. And could you talk a little bit about that? Because I know it was kind of near and dear to your heart, and especially w with your mom living in one of them. And, and uh, uh Tell us a little bit about the experiences you had with, with them, and, and um, the results were amazing. They, they were amazing. Um, and, and to me, of course, this is kind of all the same subject. But therapy chickens uh, are, have a place and a role, uh, not only just with hatching. Uh, what we did, just to give a little background, is it started a, a half a decade ago when, when we would just do incubation projects. and. And, and then we'd take a survey, and what was interesting with the residents that were there, they, were, they would, would say, uh, you know, I haven't had that feeling of awe for so long. Uh, they felt love for the little chicks coming out. They'd also an entertainment. They, they'd play a bet on what egg would hatch out first, and there was a prize for that. They, they uh, could donate a certain amount and then name the chick after whoever they wanted to name the chick after. Uh, and, of course, taking them around the little chicks till they're about 10 days old, uh, people could, um, residents could just hold them. And, and what was wonderful is in the Alzheimer's unit, especially, um, there's something about chickens and their feathers that has a different tactile response than fur or just about anything else. And, and literally, 
there would be people that would respond to these little baby chicks where they got no response from anything else. And one classic story that one of my very first experiences was now, gosh, about 20 years ago, where I was at a, a, a assisted living place and I walked in and one of the one of the participants was sitting there with his head all down to one side and he was kind of drooping, wasn't interacting at all. And at that time I had the real, the first Oprah Henfrey, Jeanette. So, so she, she was trained, she, she would lap hop with great joy, uh, just put a, a towel down in, in uh, people's laps and she'd sit there and she, they'd pet them and she'd talk to them, which was really cool. So, so in this particular guy case though, this fellow was a former police officer and was shot in the head uh, when in the line of duty and was pretty much despondent. So we asked, do you want, want to have a, Oh, Oprah Henfrey in your lap, and he just didn't really respond. So we went ahead and put the towel down and and um, put put the bird there. And he kind of looked up and goes, chicken. I go, yeah. And so he, said, he starts petting it real hard, chicken. And then Oprah's going like this. You know, they were easy, 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 Doug, real easy. It's easier. And so then literally he he uh, he softened down and he looked at it. And, and the attendants were standing around jaw dropped. They're going, we have not seen this reaction from this man almost since he was injured. And, and you could go back a week later and you could say, Doug, tell me about the chicken. He goes, chicken, chicken. You get a big smile and chicken. Aww. And that, that would, I mean, there are stories after stories after stories of that kind of interaction with them. So, mm -hmm. and with autistic. Why do, why do you think that's more popular in Europe than it is here? Because, you know, I've seen like uh, official programs over in the, the Netherlands, uh, I believe it was Netherlands or Belgium, where they've got an organized, you know, national program where um, people in, uh, in, in particular seniors, um, they're bringing chickens into the facilities mm -hmm. to yeah. enrich their life. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. In fact, in Australia, the Glidden Group, uh, they did a six-month study with with uh, a, a pilot study, and and they literally found that the in, uh, it's universal. Everyone finds the same thing: the, the interaction between and among residents, uh, where they don't talk about themselves, they'll talk about the chickens, and they have something mm -hmm. to talk about. And, and that's I'm even writing a monthly article for the newsletter uh, for one of the retirement homes, and you know we have the chicken of the month, kind of little in interesting thing about it and what happens in the courtyards. Well, I think here in America we. There's a couple of things that comes to mind. One in the other countries, um, especially uh, England, Britain, and the they after World War II, they knew what it was like to be bombed out, and their chickens never left the backyard. Uh, they, they 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 kept chickens. They knew what it was like to be be starving, and and they they do I think a, quite a bit. At least they used to more gardening than uh, possibly we do now. I, I know our our. Um, my parents did quite a bit of gardening, and but it's it's kind of rare now. So I don't know why it's more. There seems to be a prejudice here in the U.S. I was even on on Capitol Hill talking to the lawyer uh, of the mayor about making chickens legal in our in our nation's capital, and and they they he said the the Afro American community don't want it because to them chickens are uh, a symbol of poverty. You know, they, they they sort of represent poor poor people, poor food. Uh, they're dirty. They're licey. They're they stink. Uh, so we've got that stigma that that chickens are just not uh, not healthy to have around, and that's part of it anyway. Did that answer your question, yeah, Jeanette? Sorry, I had someone knocking on my door here. <laughs> I mean, there there's so much more that could be said, but I'm sure you've got a perspective on it too. I think we're going to be making more headways, but I've literally had some. Um, you know, when I used to be co-host of the Chicken Whisperer talk show you know, 15 years ago, we would follow these battles. They literally turned into local wars about the rights to have a family flock. And it would go go to court in some cases. And there were some that were so adamant on the other side. And sometimes it'd go, sometimes it wouldn't. But I was astonished how feverishly so many people were against chickens to the point where they would alienate the community. To I mean, I mean literally cause cause of hard feelings kind of even worse than the democrats and republicans right now it'd be you know for chickens and not for chickens but anyway <laughs> yeah well and i see a lot of people are really paranoid about the you know the biosecurity thing and salmonella and you know 
I, I do see the salmonella problems as really a, a product of people doing really silly things with their chickens, like kissing them and, you know, not washing their hands. And, and I kiss my uh, chickens. You know, but I wash sense, my hands too. But the salmonella you know, thing is, is if think, you keep them clean, in my opinion, and, and they have clean water. I'm sorry, Jeanette, but that's it's it's more of a problem, in my opinion, in the, the larger uh, commercial flocks yeah. than it is in your backyard flocks. Well, and if you think about how many crops are, you know, salmonella contaminated, you see a lot more problem there than you do with backyard chickens. But, uh, you know, just try to approach it with common sense and, sure. and you know, uh, it is recommended not to kiss your chicken, but, you know, um, but Especially I- Especially if it I, has COVID. That's true. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that was, so- That was a joke. Um, huh? That was yeah, a we'll joke. We'll just say yeah. that uh, chickens don't have COVID. <laughs> so far, so far they don't. As, as far as we know. <laughs> I, and I can tell you, chickens like to cuddle too. I mean, you can take them to the movies, you know, get some popcorn and turn on a, a a show, a movie after they'll just settle down and fall asleep. Basically, that's what I, you know, I teach yeah. an online well, course on I, therapy chickens. Um, it's a training of mm -hmm. handlers and their birds to do public visitations, and and that's one of the ways to to uh, get a chicken trained that they can be lap hoppers. And yeah. Anyway, well, I have a lot of fun with my traveling chickens, as you um, uh, as you can uh, have seen. Colbert. You know, I had. Bear, oh, I still cry for that chicken. <laughs> you made uh, fun of me for <laughs> everywhere with me. He was such a well traveled chicken. Uh, you know, we went to New York City and Nashville and all kinds of events, and he was just the perfect chicken. He anybody could hold him, and and he was strange enough looking because he had that big top knot and the beard and he was just so fun to look at and would get such a great response. And I am training up a new uh, therapy Crevcore this year, and hopefully we'll have one that I'll be able to travel and have fun with. And uh, mm -hmm. what I find so amazing is, um, you know, people are so disconnected from where their food comes from that they rarely, uh, I mean, most people rarely get to see a live chicken. And, That's right. Um, it's, it's a novelty here. That's right. It is. And a little it chick is. is even more dramatic. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the places that we go to every year is the big uh, tractor supply uh, meeting um, in Nashville. And, and, you know, you have several thousand people that are in the farming feed and equipment business. And, my goodness, you pull out a chicken and it's like they've never seen it before. And I'm like, you, yeah. you got a good tractor supply. And yeah. everybody wants to get a selfie with the chicken. Yes, that's right. Chicken. And um, what I really enjoy is for someone that's frightened and to get them to realize it's okay to touch them. And uh, the, the last one, there was a lady that was like two rows over from us and you know, looking at the chickens from a distance. And at the beginning of the show, she was terrified, but then saw all these people touching the chickens. And when we were coming back for lunch and hardly anybody was on the floor, she's like, you know, I think I'm ready to hold it. And can I hold it? And, and, you know, she was so proud and had her picture taken with it. But to get people to realize that chickens are not these, you know, wild crazy things there are exceptions but if you know how to handle a chicken properly and you remain calm the chicken's going to remain calm and you can have a really great experience and um i i just love that about um teaching people is you know that aha moment where hey i'm a chicken ram wrangler and you remember the? Do you remember those uh, teenage kids that that we had over at Mother Earth in Kansas, where uh, none of them had ever held a chicken before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They had those crazy wild Menorca cockerels, and the kids, uh, you know, I, I I showed them how to hold the chickens, and every time the chicken moved, the kids were like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> you know, chicken go, the, the kids would jump. 
I'm like, look, the chicken's not going to hurt you. This is the way you hold it. And by the end, they were all expert chicken wranglers and, mm -hmm. and they really were crazy wild Menorcas, but because they were held properly, they mm -hmm. calmed down, they weren't anxious and, you know, and I, I, I really uh, it, have fun with that. And uh, uh, Brittany, are there any questions out there? Let's see, we've got a couple. Uh, let's see, Farmer Brad was saying the deep litter <laughs> method for the win when we were talking about composting. So. Hi, Farmer Brad. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good friend. Excellent. Uh, Bert Stanley says, wish there were a better method of dealing with predators. They're a real problem. Any recommendations? Oh, gosh. Oh, there, yeah. You there's a lot of first? things you can do. Well, yeah. first is know your predators. Some some are worse than others. But I find uh, having – chickens are night blind. Uh, that's one thing. So they have to be able to get in and up securely at night. And, and that means really secure. That mean even Even a little hole in the coop a weasel can get into, I found out the hard way. So that's probably the first thing. Uh, having these automatic door openers and closers are a wonderful asset to, to chicken keeping. And then a good either perimeter fence or a good guard dog yep. uh, is, is really, really high up there. Um, and, and just expect to lose some. I mean, I, I figure about 10% the, the predators need to eat too. Um, at the retirement community, we just lost uh, four uh, little baby chicks to the red-tailed hawk, beautiful bird. And, and you know, it's like, it's okay. It's part of the food chain. They also took out two little ducklings. But, so that's, I think, is the main thing, is, is allowing them to get in, up, and secure. What, Jeanette, I'll pass it over to you. Jeanette, do you have any recommendations for predator-proofing? Jeanette? She might be having some yeah she might be yeah so so predators i think probably bobcats are kind of pretty rough because they'll they can hop they can jump like eight, eight to ten feet and they'll do it during the day oh, wow. and can take out your little guard dog if it's not very big so that's probably one of the toughest sure huh? let's see lisa marie recommended a guardian dog um, i've got a little sheltered Oh, the internet's not Peter cooperating today. <laughs> I think we're yeah. having internet issues. What were you saying, Pat? About is, do you have a good oh, dog? If, well, there are ways to train your dog poultry protectors, and, and mine. We we did the uh, chicken whisper Caesar Milan's. Uh, work. We sat together on the couch after I adopted her and watched the first seven of the nine seasons. And she literally uh, is part of the flock. She drinks out of their water. She eats out of their feeders. She, she, of course, sleeps in at night. But if there's something outside, she's all over it. Um, and I haven't lost a single bird since I adopted her. That Somehow she, she just knows innately that... Uh, so those birds are different from squirrels and <laughs> different from other things. That do. So training is, is a big, big deal with, with uh, your poultry dogs. You can't expect an untrained dog to, to just, uh, with, without some specialized training, to be a poultry protector. And, and Caesar goes into that a little bit. But and how about you, Jeanette? How's your, how's your well, dog? Because, <laughs> because, my, because my birds are, have top knots and beards, their line to sight is basically, you know, looking down at the crown. They can't see above and to the sides. And so they're um, very vulnerable to every kind of predator there is. And with um, my coops, you know, they're protected in coops. They don't free range. And I've uh, run a couple of strands of hot wire around the entire perimeter of the coops for the four-legged predators. And then for raptors, I have strands of wire in six inch intervals that goes across the top because we have a lot of trees around our coops. And in the fall, the leaves and the pine needles fall into the coops. And if you've got mesh or, wi or, or wire mesh, 
it's a huge mess in the fall, but this way branches or leaves all fall through the wire. And so I've got these, you know, six inch intervals of wire and you just, you know, I tighten them up once a year and raptors will not fly through that. And back in my zoo days, you know, you created raptor enclosures with piano wire, just like that. And, you know, it would keep an eagle in. So I figure, you know, it, it could do a good job for my birds. And um, since we did that about, what, eight years ago, we haven't had a single loss to raptors. And I can tell you, they sit in the trees and look at the chickens, but they never yeah. challenge that wire. And um, the challenge with that is if you've got a chicken tractor and uh, electric uh, fence, um, and it's not so easy to do that, but I'm actually coming up with some kind of solution for chicken tractors because a lot of folks with chicken tractors have trouble with raptors. And I've come up with an idea that I think will be portable so that you can use it um, with um, moving, uh, you know, uh, uh, temporary poultry uh, netting. Um, so, um, I'm hoping I can come up with something that'll work because that's the biggest complaint I hear with predators is them getting nailed, um, in chicken tractors and open fields. And, and I think we can do something about that, but I apologize. And, and with, I've got a big mouth poodle. Who's with backyard flocks too, uh, one of the things that I think we're going to be learning more about it is, is, uh, planting, I call it birdscaping. I mean, I didn't name it, but, but literally planting plants that help provide an overstory that get, give protection for the birds. And an interesting thing happened. I'm currently living in a, Dad, I think you're breaking up again. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you, okay. yeah. I didn't catch any of that. Did you catch that, Jeanette? No, she's frozen. I know. Oh. <laughs> We're having all sorts of I'm bad issues. Thing. Yes, I can hear you, Jeanette. Uh, sorry, Pat, do you mind saying that one more time? Sure, sure, and I'll make it more succinct. And, and, and that is uh, for backyard flocks and, and even birds that might be in a, in a wooded area to ha plant an overstory, which is mm. gives them a, a shelter underneath. Uh, and, you know, Tall crops like uh, asparagus work great. Uh, certainly some of the uh, honeysuckle that we have here is, is wonderful, but, but whatever it is, so the chickens can get in and under and shelter. And then my birds have learned to watch the wild birds because when the wild birds go quiet or if something uh, is amiss, the, the chickens will, will tune into that and they'll disappear like the other wild birds do. So there's an interspecies signaling that is going on to warn everyone, oh, there's a hawk. And you look and sure enough, it's right up there in the tree. And then it goes, flies away because there's mm -hmm. sort of nothing to see or so much commotion. That's cool. Let's see. Um, Hanson Heritage Home said, so they're enjoying all of your heartwarming stories. Oh, and thanks. Rent the chicken. Oh, the hey. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> That's great. They're wonderful people. <laughs> Pamela Strong was telling us about her rescue rooster and rehab. Um, he's going to be in therapy until his injuries heal. They call him Hayes. So good luck with your therapy rooster, Pamela. Yeah. And roosters can be therapy roosters. I mean, you think of their, but I've got, I've had little silkies in the past that, I mean, they're just like little puff balls and totally put a little bow tie on them. I mean, they're, they, they'll melt to anybody. It's yeah. just the, just so sweet. I love Roosters. that on bow tie. Um, Hanson yeah. Heritage Homestead also wants to know what your personal favorite breed of chickens are. Well, Jeanette only has crevcores. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it depends on on the the use of them because there are some things like the, the crevcores I, I like because of their history and they're fun to look at and 
and I love the Buckeyes because they're just so darn tasty. You know, they're really wonderful meat birds. And and then I I adore uh, Thebrites and Nankins because they're just a, you know, small handful of a chicken, you know, and then you've got, you know, the Brahmas, which are these ginormous chickens that you can't help but be in awe over. And so it's like, Picking your favorite star in the sky. It's nearly impossible. Um, but I, I I appreciate a well-bred chicken more than anything else. Because it's a it's a hard thing to accomplish and and I know how much hard work it goes into. So um I I suppose I appreciate more than anything a well-bred animal that you can see quality and efforts been put into creating that bird. I come from a little bit different tact. I like having an eye candy flock and I can identify the individuals. So I've probably got about 10 breeds out there in my, my yard right now. And uh, well-bred birds are certainly beautiful to behold. And if anyone wants to see some amazing examples, go to the nationals, the APA nationals in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Every year, second second weekend of January or November, I think it is. Yeah, it was but canceled this year. Canceled this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I've got this sort of thing up for the under chicken. You know, some of these little chickens they kind of get beaten up on, or they're just kind of shy or whatever. I kind of I uh, I'll, I'll take them and try to give them more self confidence and and bring them more to the the forefront. So, I'm I'm not breed specific so much as. And I got to tell you, Jeanette, some of my most beautiful birds were crossed uh, between those beautiful breeds. Uh, you cross a black ostlerp with a buff Orpington, you get a magnificent looking bird that doesn't look anything like a classic bird, but the feathering is really dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's the great thing is everybody can have their own preferences. And and, uh, and I am yeah. so appreciative to the breeders to keeping those breeds alive. I mean, we, we do need, uh, especially younger people coming in more to, to the, the shows and, and preserving these heritage breeds. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we try to reach out to uh, elementary uh, school kids with our Chicks in the Classroom project and have them hatching out heritage chicks. And um, the chicks go back to the breeder that provided the hatching eggs and, and um, you know, hopefully help to create a, a new generation. And also the uh, APA has a wonderful, uh, that's the American Poultry Association has a wonderful uh, youth program um, that is fabulous for, for kids that want to learn more about raising poultry and, and showing. And, um, and P. Allen Smith recently has started providing um, prizes and ribbons for the youth. Mm -hmm categories so um some of the ribbons are the size of a child's head in his own words and uh it really motivates kids to to show chickens um but uh it's it's really hard to pick a favorite uh you know yeah and, and they have, can have extremely different personalities as well don't think chickens don't have personalities I'm going to have to uh, get get back here pretty shortly. Um, we were supposed to go about yeah. half an hour. Is that right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'd, I'd like no, to just thank you so much for coming on. Well, I, I'd like yeah. to kind of uh, conclude at least my part here with a an ancient poultry proverb that says, "If you give a person eggs, they'll just have an omelet. But if you give them a family flock, they'll have eggs and omelets for a lifetime." And I want to also add in that the, the parable, you, may, you remember the mustard seed parable where, where in the Bible it says something as small as a mustard seed can, can faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. Well, I would like us across the world to understand that the chickens combined with composting can literally create mountains of topsoil. And even, even more important than that, or as important than that, they can help keep mountains of trash out of landfills. So that's, that's, I think, what we need to go for it. And, and literally, take this literally, ask not what you can do with chickens, but what chickens can do for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> may the it. flock be with you. And with that you, point, I need to sign off. You so. as well. And this is Pat's so website. And thank you for joining us. We really appreciate My it. My honor. I appreciate what, and, and really <laughs> love what you guys do too. Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> we don't <laughs> plan on it. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Okay. 
Bye. Thank you, Pat. All right, Jeanette, do you want to keep answering some questions? Okay. I guess that is all for today. Um, any questions that we didn't get to, we will um, try to answer in the comments. Thank you for everyone joining in today, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks. We'll be back next week with Horse Chats, so please uh, tune in for those.